I don't want to be on the camera. So you don't want to be on the camera. That's fine. So um, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Dominique Alfandari um, in Vent Mobile Sciences. As many of you know, we have some fantastic facilities for doing proteomics type experiments at UMass. Um, but I will admit firsthand that sample preparation is not my expertise. So John does this for a living. Um, he does IPs like every day. <laughs> And he has an amazing amount of expertise in how to do the other sample preparation. So um, that's all I'm going to say. Okay. Please have questions afterwards. Talk to each other, talk to Tom about how to make samples. Enjoy. Thank you. Yes, and, and uh, don't hesitate to uh, stop at any point to ask questions. Uh, this, this is a very informal uh meeting i did not prepare very much because i don't know what we're going to talk about it will depend a lot on what uh, uh you guys want okay so i have a very basic presentation with some example and then you know i'm going to draw on the ipad the way i design my experiments and what are the parameter and, and uh thing of that nature okay so uh first what this presentation is not okay so it's not a detailed protocol you can't take note and just go to your lab and and, and start your experiment uh it's not an elaborate theory about what mass spec is and how it works i know less than most of you guys i'm sure um it's not a bioinformatic course i'm going to use to show you how i use the tools that i know but i'm no expert and it's not sponsored uh, so uh, by any manufacturer or or, or uh, of uh, instrument or or uh, enzyme or whatever. Okay, so the goals are uh, <clears throat> to give an introduction to how to set up the parameter for your own experiments. Okay, uh, give some option to identify protein partner and complex. Uh, most people, that's what they want. They've got their favorite protein. If they're lucky, they have a good antibody to it. And they want to see what binds to it in different conditions. Um, I'm going to also show you what is, I've, I've been struggling to analyze these data for, for a while. So I've, I've finally uh, discovered some tool that were always there, but that I didn't know how to use. And uh, uh, hopefully that will make your analysis a lot easier and faster. Um, I'm going to also provide you with a list of common mistakes. I've done all of them, uh, so I can tell you, you know, it, how to, I, I can definitely tell you how not to do the experiments, okay? Uh, and I want to answer uh, some question and work on example from my own lab. None of these is published, so, uh, you know, don't. I know you're going to share the presentation, just don't stole my data. <laughs> uh, as for you guys, anybody that knows how to work with protein, you know, that we use protein inhibitor, protease inhibitor, uh, that know how protein interacts, uh, you know, the, the basic minimum is, is, uh, is knowing how to deal with protein. Okay, so the first, thing that is going to be different for every one of us is our starting material okay so you might be working with cell culture and have an unlimited supply of protein you might work with a bacterial fusion protein or bacterial protein or plant protein or you might work with you know eight cell mouse embryo okay your problem is very different depending on how much protein Okay, and so what is important is that uh, you don't need a milligram. Who is calling me? Okay, uh, you don't need a milligram of protein to start your experiment. Okay, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. I work with you know embryo explant, two hundred cells at a time, uh, and I can collect uh, whatever they secrete, whatever is on their plasma membrane or in their nuclei, uh, and, and, and that works, okay? So I'm confident that 
no matter what you work with, you can work with a very small amount. I've done mass spec using one microgram of total protein and gotten some very nice result with Steve. Um, more is not always better, okay? Because it's as always when you work with protein, whether it's fluorescence or anything else, it's a signal to noise ratio, okay? So if you have very little protein, your noise is going to be very low and your signal, if you have any, is going to be good. If you start loading loads of protein and total extract, what you're going to see is actin, myosin, uh, you know, and, and whatever, you know, human keratin, uh, if, if you work uh, not so cleanly, okay? Um, you want an antibody or an affinity tag, okay? So the antibody is going to bind to your protein specifically. Uh, an affinity tag can be on the N, on the C-terminus, it can be GFP, it can be flag, it can be uh, anything. Uh, there are advantage and disadvantage of both. The advantage of having an antibody is you can work with your actual protein in your actual cells. You don't need to express uh, ectopic protein, okay? The disadvantage is wherever your antibody binds, um, it's going to displace other protein that might be really important partners, okay? Um, so having a tag that is outside of the protein and as a linker might be an advantage in some case, okay? And maybe a combination of tagged experiments versus endogenous protein pulled down with a specific antibody might be, you know, the combination might, might uh, be useful, okay? Any questions so far? Yes, Anna? The, whatever you do is, is uh, uh, so the question is, uh, what about global protein analysis as opposed to targeted protein analysis? Yes, if you want to see what are the protein expressed in a sperm, from a wild type animal to a knockout animal, that's fine, you can do that. Assuming that that knockout is going to significantly change the protein that are present in your two sample. I'm not talking about quantitative, okay? I'm only talking about qualitative. There are people that are much better at quantitative analysis, uh, TMT labeling. I've done a little bit of it, but that's not, what I'm describing here. Um, and if you want to see, you know, a cell with a protein and a cell without that protein, what are the overall change, then you can do RNA-seq, quantitative RNA-seq, you can do qualitative proteomics, and that's probably going to tell you more, okay? My approach will be, what are the proteins that are missing in one of the sample? Not which one are going up or down, that's, that's not, what most people that I meet with are, are interested, so. Okay, workflow. Uh, in my lab, what we do is we, so you first extract your protein, okay? And then either you're going to do a total extract or you're going to purify your protein. Again, it's going to be either with a tag or with an antibody to your actual protein. Once you have that protein, purified, you're going to uh, treat it with trypsin so that you fragment that protein in multiple peptides. And then you're going to analyze these peptides so that, uh, uh, and you're going to match them against the genome of uh, your species um, and, and identify all the protein that you can identify, okay? The number of peptide that you can see in a single experiment is going to be the limiting factor, okay? You can't, you know, I don't know what is the maximum number of, of spectra that you can analyze in one sample, but, you know, the, the run is 90 minutes, and, you know, typically I get 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 uh, spectra in one of my experiments, and that's going to give me several thousand proteins. Okay, uh, 
I don't know whether you can push that a lot higher. Okay, so if you want more protein, like you are looking at a total extract, then what you want is separate uh, your sample in multiple groups. So you can separate according to the size. And so now if instead of having one total protein extract, you now have split it into eight groups of protein according to the size, instead of getting, you know, 3,000 protein in one sample, you're going to take 3,000 protein in each of your subtraction. So it's going to increase the depth of your analysis, okay? Again, signal to noise ratio, if most of your sample is BSA or human cytokeratin, uh, that's a lot, you know, all these spectra cannot be used to identify the protein of interest, okay? So I work with frog embryo, if most of the protein I detect are human cytokeratin, okay, that means the student didn't wear a glove or they cough in their sample when they were working. You know, it's, it's, uh, <coughs> it, for me, it's easy to tell what is a contaminant versus not a contaminant, okay? I also work with my frog protein into human Hector 93 t cells when I'm looking at protein that interacts, okay? Uh, uh, it's very convenient for me to put my xenopus protein into the human stuff. And what I've done is I take the human protein database and I just add in the database. I just add in my database uh, my frog proteins, okay? So that they should be recognized, hopefully. Okay, so I know that my protein worked if uh, my, my, my experiment worked if one of the most abundant protein I find in my sample is the protein that I had added to my sample, okay? Transfected uh, in, in cells, okay? Uh, it's pretty simple. These are FASTA database. You can use any text editor to add any number of sequence that you want and make your own database. Just don't save it as a basic human database because people don't want frog protein in their human database, okay? Uh, but you save it as your own um, and, and you know, try to keep track of all the protein you've added. Um, we use database that have the most common uh, contaminants, human keratin, uh, BSA, um, you know, mouse immunoglobulin, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that um, if, if, you, if in your sample, you're digested all this protein and you have the peptide corresponding to, you've done a immunoprecipitation with a mouse antibody, okay? And you've digested that mouse antibody with trypsin, okay? You're going to have a bunch of peptide that correspond to that mouse immunoglobulin. Okay, if you don't have that protein in your database, it's going to be trying to match this peptide to human protein that are not really present. Okay, so by having the contaminants that you probably have in your experiments, it avoids the false detection of protein um, that, that are not really there, but that are just coming from um, the uh, contamination. Okay. Okay. So let's change a little bit and let's draw some stuff. I'll, I'll get back to the presentation, but for now. Uh, and I want to share again. I don't know what's in the chat. Are, are you checking what's in the chat? If there are a question to, okay. Oops. Okay. Okay, and I'm not an artist, okay, so. 
uh, it's going to be very basic. Okay, so let's say this is my protein of interest, okay, or your protein of interest. And my goal is to, come on, I want to change color. Okay. And it's binding to all sort of other partners that are, you know, brown with different domains. And these are the guys that I want to identify. Okay. And I happen to have an antibody. Um, okay, so we're going to do a you know, classic Y antibody. Okay. So that is the theory of the experiment. Okay, you notice that I've got my antibody in blue. It's binding to my protein at a site that is conveniently away from protein protein interaction domains uh, so that it is recognized in a native uh, uh, protein. Okay, so in your protein extract, that's antigen is going to be available for the antibody to bind to it, okay? Uh, if I had my antibody binding to that spot, okay, there would be a competition between the brown protein or that, that want to bind to that site and my antibody, okay? So best case scenario, my antibody wins and it displaces these proteins. But that means these proteins are not going to be present in my mass spec, okay? Worst case scenario, the interaction with this protein masks the epitope, so the antibody does not bind to that protein, okay? And then I can't work. This is the reason why when you are working by immunofluorescence, you're fixing with formaldehyde, you're complex. If, you know, if uh, my antibody recognizes epitope one, I'm fine. If my antibody recognize a p-tub two, it's never going to work after fixing in formaldehyde because now these complex are stuck forever. <coughs> okay, so that's the nature. Either your antibody is an immunoprecipitating antibody or it's not, okay? And then I'm going to attach stuff, whoops. No, I don't want to erase. I'm going to attach things to this antibody to be able to pull it off my total protein extract, okay? Um, typically, we like to use magnetic beads, protein A, G, magnetic beads that interact with the heavy chain antibody um, and uh, allow you to, with a magnet, to pull the complex to one side of your tube. The main advantage of this stuff is that you always have heavy structure that fall down at the bottom of your tube. And if you're using agro beads to pull down your antibody protein complex, they tend to fall with this contaminant all the time and you can't wash that away. With the magnet, it's the magnet gets on the side and then gravity is going to make all the large complex fall down and it's much easier to get a clean uh, sample in that way. Okay, so basically, you know, I've got my magnet here and uh, any protein that is not uh, attached is going to fall off and be sucked out in the, you know, uh, when, when you wash your sample, okay? I never assume anything. <laughs> Rephrase. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the question is, uh, I'm assuming that uh, I'm extracting in native conditions. Uh, yes, if you want your antibody to be able to recognize your protein, it needs to be native enough that the antibody doesn't get killed by, you know, if you have that 1% SDS and DTT in your sample, you've got to dilute that. Otherwise, you're going to kill the antibody. You won't be able to purify an acid. If you're looking for complex, you're going to want to be as native as possible. Okay. So if you're working with cytoplasmic protein that you want to have a, a, a notion of what complex, 
And then you use, you know, PBS with protease phosphatase inhibitory cocktail, no detergents or minimum amount of detergents uh, because, you know, something that mimic what the cytoplasm is. If you're working with a transmembrane protein or a nuclear protein, you want, uh, you know, non-ionic detergent like Triton 1%. Um, or NP40, 1%. Uh, so that's, the antibody works perfectly well in 1% non-ionic detergents. Uh, many people use REPA buffer, which has DOC and SDS. It's not optimum for protein-protein interaction. Um, it works well if you have, you know, like integrating alpha and beta subunit which are co-translated and exported to the surface, they resist dark and, and small percentage of SDS. But if you're looking at a kinase interaction with the substrate, it's never going to work in REPA, okay? So uh, you want to be as gentle when you extract as, as possible. 1% tritent, X100 or 0.1% is, is fine, okay? Uh, so you extract, you have protease, phosphatase, maybe it's your cocktail, um, and, and you incubate, uh, you spin out all the debris, you uh, incubate with your antibody bound to the beads, and you do several wash. Okay, if you've ever done an immunoprecipitation or a co-IP with a Western after, same exact principle, okay? And I would even argue, same amount is fine, okay? So now that we're talking about amount, okay? It's very difficult when you're doing a co-IP to determine what is the proper amount of each of the stuff that you have, okay? What you want is an excess of the protein. Sometimes it's difficult. If you're working with mouse embryo, it's difficult to have an excess. But then don't overkill with your antibodies, okay? so. As a baseline, typically I'm going to use about 10 microgram of my primary antibody. Okay. And the minimum amount of beads that will bind these 10 microgram of antibody. Okay. And then I'm going to assume that if I work properly 100% efficiently, I'm going to have 10 microgram of my protein of interest attached to it. Okay. You, you know, I also do the molecular ratio. I know my antibody is 150 kilodalton. Uh, uh, if my protein is 15 kilodalton, obviously I'm going to have one microgram instead of 10 microgram, okay, of my protein of interest. If it's 100 kilodalton protein, I will assume that I have the same amount of antibody and antigen in my prep, okay? And obviously I don't know what, other protein are sticking to it, okay? So I basically assume that none of them are sticking to it, okay? And so I'm going to, I will never measure the amount of protein that I have from my immunoprecipitation, okay? I just will assume that I have now 20 microgram of protein in my sample. It's a, you know, bull pack figure. The only thing I can control is how much of the primary antibody I've put it. If I have an excess of my protein sample, if I'm working with cell line and I use, you know, one 10 centimeter plate, I know I'm going to have at least 10 microgram of any protein that I'm looking at, okay? And so that will be my maximum. And that's what I'm going to use to base how much trypsin that I need to digest, okay? <clears throat> so the simplest way we do the experiments is we pull down, we wash the protein, and then directly on the magnetic beads. <clears throat> so once I have that protein sample clean, clean, okay, so I've got my magnet, magnetic beads on one side of the tube. I've rinsed three, four times with my extraction buffer. Um, and then I get rid of any of the liquid, okay? And then I replace that with uh, eight smaller urea okay, with Tris to get the pH right, and with DTT to denature. For this, 
you just follow the Promega protocol. I don't invent uh, anything. I just use that, okay? And I typically will use for 20 microgram of protein, I'm going to resuspend my bead in 20 microliter and do the uh, uh, denaturation and do the uh, desulfate bridge breaking in that and then alkylation. I just follow the Promega trypsin Golds protocol at that point, okay? <clears throat> and so I'm going to digest the entire stuff, including the antibody, including the protein AG on the bees. So I know these are my known contaminants, plus my students or my own cytokeratin from the gloves that broke or from the time that I went to get my coffee and forgot to put my glove back. Okay, so these are the minimum number of contaminants that I expect in my sample. Okay. And with this, Steve runs his magic and he can run three, four uh, times that, that sample uh, so that I can get a sense of how reproducible, like a technical replicate, um, if, if I want to make sure that, you know, what I'm saying or adding all the peptide that I discover at each of the runs, okay? So you can run just one time or, you know, this stuff you typically resuspend in what, 10 microliter of you. Okay, so basically there is enough in that sample to run four time your experiments, okay? It costs more, okay? He doesn't do the four time for free, even for me. Okay, but so that that gives you an idea of if I had four times less protein, it would still work. Okay, this this is my routine quantity. Okay, uh, any question at that point? Okay, I have yes. <clears throat> Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's plus or minus twofold. We don't care about that. We're talking about order of magnitude. If it's 10 times more or 10 times less, you might be in trouble. 10 times less, probably not. It's going to work. 10 times more, you know, your digestion might not be complete, but you're going to see something. Yes, Anna. Yeah. So if I had a tag, yeah, flag, flag is, is the best tag. Uh, and we've made an activity to flag that is better than all of the commercial ones. So it's pretty practically free. Um, so. Okay. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> so that's that's a, the 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 secret of mass spec is it's total irreproducibility. Okay. Um, you can run three times the same sample and get fifty percent overlap in these three samples. Okay. So I've stopped trying to get reproducibility. Uh, what, what interests me more is, um, you know, what, what makes sense? And then I do co-IP when I want to confirm the interaction. I'm going to do co-IP. And if I can repeat that experiments with co-IP for the protein that I've selected, uh, I, I'm happy with that, okay? If you limit yourself to stuff that are in three biological replicates, your list of candidates is going to be so small and so boring that you might as well not do it, okay? Um, so I would, you know, yes, obviously, if you want, if, you, if your goal is to publish mass spec data in a mass spec paper, you will most likely get triplicates requirements. My goal is not that. Okay, I identify interesting pathway and proteins with the mass spec. And then from that, I'm going to do a full investigation of the protein that bind to my stuff 
how do they affect each other? Why do they bind? Which domain they bind? By that time, the fact that I found it by mass spec is cherry on the cake, but it's barely makes it into the paper. Okay. So, you know, and that's why I'm not a mass spec professional. Okay. So, another caveat is that some protein are very hard to detect. Okay. My protein is so heavily modified that sometimes I don't see it. I see all the protein that it binds to, but I don't see it because there are so many glycosylation on the site on the outside, so many D cells to bridge on the outside. Uh, every single amino acid in the cytoplasmic domain is modified uh, by phosphorylation, alkylation, methylation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that it is very difficult to detect. When I overexpress it into nitrogen cells, being the only xenopus protein, I can see it. But from you know my my super small embryo extract, um, I've seen it once, I think, in ten years. Uh, but I do see the same partner coming, and when I knock it down, I see all the partner dis disappearing. I just don't see my protein. Okay. Uh, good. Okay, so let's go back now to uh, total extract. Okay, so this is the analysis of uh, it's the uh, shotgun type of analysis. Okay, the advantage is with each each immunoprecipitation will give you one sample. It's going to cost you a hundred bucks. Okay, now if you want to see in detail and uh, uh, all the protein that are binding to it, you can run the same sample on on a gel. Okay, uh, you have your positive, your negative control, and then you identify a band that is present or absent in one of your sample. You cut that band, you elude it from that band, you digest it, and you will know for sure what that protein is. But each band is going to cost you a hundred bucks. Okay. If you have 10 protein of interest, it's a thousand bucks. Okay. Without counting replicates. Um, and typically what we find is that whenever we cut one band that seemed to be different, we had it in the shotgun. It's just that we didn't notice it because it was one among thousands of protein. Okay. But once you cut that band, then you identify it and you find stuff that, you know, yes, it was an obvious candidate that we did not see before. Okay. So if you're looking at total extracts of neural crest cells in the presence or absence of your total protein, okay, and you're a chipster like me, you're going to first look at all the protein all together, okay? And you're going to start with 10 to 20 microgram of total protein extract. And you're going to see if there are obvious stuff that jumps at you. And you're going to do replicate and see whether there is still obvious chance. If you want to know for sure, you know, have something that is comparable to an RNA-seq experiment, then you're going to run this sample on large gel cut each of the sample into 10 or 12 different little gel slab, do a mass spec for each of these gel slab, fuse all of this mass spec data, and have 30,000 protein for your control, 30,000 protein for your experimental, and of, hopefully some of them are going to be different in each of your samples. It's going to be a better experiment. It's going to be a much more exper expensive experiment. Okay. Um, but yes, that's a proper way of doing, you know, when, when you talk with pro that do these sort of things, they don't even think about, you know, uh, uh, shotgun experiments. Now in a small lab like mine, uh, the shotgun experiments give you, you know, a good 80% of your answer. And uh, at, 1% of the cost. So it's, it's definitely a good approach. Okay. So, 
I'm going to go back to my presentation and then go to share again. Uh, so this is actually uh oops, where is my this is an actual experiment okay <laughs> The goal of that experiment is, I don't know if any of you guys use bio ID uh, to identify protein that come close. You add a, a protein that can add biotin to all the protein that come within 10 nanometer of your protein. Really nice for transient interaction, okay? The problem with that is that in frog embryo, like, like in uh, most embryo and in mammalian cells, there are some protein that are naturally biotin laden and they are super abundant. So that's an example. If you take embryo, frog embryo extracts, oh, I should uh, point. If you take frog embryo extract at different stage and you run them on the gel and then you do a blood with nitravidin HRP, you see these two major bands. If you pull down with nitravidin HRP uh, and you stain with Kumasi, you see these two major bands. Okay, so that means that, you know, if I had a plus or a, a minus and plus bio ID sample, they would look identical. Okay, so that means that if you try to use bio ID and then just pull with streptavidin, you're going to get mostly these protein here. Okay, so uh, my goal was to figure out what are these proteins. Turns out I could have identified that by just doing a Google search, but it's good because actually there are some proteins that are different in frogs. And, uh, but, but basically uh, here I have, so here are the two protein. This is a hundred kilodalton, this is 50 kilodalton. So 130 and 60 kilodalton. And I don't know if I can magnify that. I don't know if you guys can see that, but um, so the stuff with the stars are the protein that are at the right size that are identified um, and that are known to be biotin -lated. Okay, so uh, uh, some enzyme of the uh, glucose uh, cycle uh, are biotin -lated, and that part of their function. Okay, and there is one at 130. And they form a complex with non biotinylated stuff. Uh, uh, and basically, you've got uh, one subunit at 130, and you've got several subunits at 60 kilodalton. So it makes perfect sense. And I can detect those. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm showing you that these are different. So, whoops, low battery. Hopefully, that will survive. Okay, so uh, I'm showing you that because, so the experiments we did is we pulled down with streptavidin some embryo extract, and then we did mass spec by digesting directly the streptavidin beads with the protein attached to that uh, uh, to identify which of these protein were, okay? If you look at the upper, so the, the star here correspond to all the protein that I would expect to be present. Okay, uh, after the fact, okay, they are the right size and they're known to be biotin laden. There are a bunch of protein, okay? So there are different ways. I'm, after uh, uh, I get my raw files from uh, Steve, I run it through two <clears throat> different software. The first is a thermal fisher that uh, protein, protein discover uh, that the facility uses but I don't really like, it's not very intuitive, okay? And then I run them through scaffold, okay? And so scaffold results are the stuff that I'm presenting here on the right side. And depending on what you're going to set up scaffold, it's going to give you different proteins, okay? So for example, the most abundant protein that I find in both of these samples is a myosin that 
is not biotinylated and does not associate it with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, biotinylated proteins, okay? So it's clearly an artifact. Uh, <clears throat> and so here it's fine. So I'm using both the size of the protein and either the highest number of peptide that are found in these protein, okay? And that's good, but that tends to uh, favor large proteins, okay? So whenever you do mass spec, you're going to identify tintin, okay? Because tintin has like several thousand amino acids. And basically it has a peptide for every flavor you get, okay? And I don't believe that tintin associate with every single protein known to men. So I typically also use a percent coverage, okay? If I have one peptide in a protein that can generate three peptides, okay, it's a 30% coverage. I know that one peptide is likely to be real, okay? Uh, if I have one peptide in a, you know, 250 kilo Dalton proteins, uh, I'm less impressed by that result, okay? And so by selecting what you want, either percentage coverage or the minimum number of peptide or unique peptide, it's going to give you different results and, and uh, you can select what you want, okay? Yes. Why don't you come closer, Anna? You're asking all the questions. She doesn't answer to me. That's a separate talk. Nope. No, you get the raw data. If, if you want to pay Steve more, we will get you the thermal Fisher stuff. Um, but it's, it's very difficult to, for me to look at it, okay? And the reason why this is difficult here is I have only one sample, okay? So if I have only one sample, there is no two condition that I can compare to. So I have to rely more on the score that I get on the right side, okay? So if, if yeah, it's, it's just, I'm pulling down protein that stick to streptavidin in embryos. So here I don't have a negative control, otherwise I would have two colors. Here I don't have a negative control because I'm just looking for stuff that stick to uh, uh, streptavidin. I could have just one lane with just streptavidin being digested, and that would give me peptide. I always insert in my database as the streptavidin sequence. Okay, so I will know which peptide corresponds to streptavidin just because they will show up in my database. Yes. Yes, I'm always digesting on this. So I have tried to elude. Okay, um, if you're working with an antibody. If you elute with urea or low soul, uh, low pH or whatever, you're going to elute your antibody. So there is no real advantage of eluting. If you're using flag and you elute with flag antibody, okay, it's going to be more selective. But then you got to get rid of that flag peptide, okay. And you know when you do a G50 or something like that, you're going to lose the flag peptide as well as 50% of your protein, okay. So. What I find by doing both is that simpler is often better. And I don't try to elute anymore. If you're on streptavidin Bs, it's actually really hard to elute from streptavidin. Okay, so I prefer to have my streptavidin peptide and my streptavidin sequence in there so that any peptide corresponding to streptavidin is going to be recognized and not attributed to the different protein. Yeah. No, I don't. We, we've tried, you know, Lamely and other stuff, uh, but then you've got to get rid of that stuff too. So urea, not too sure if it does or not. So, you know, yeah. Okay, so that's an example where I'm, I only have one sample, very cheap. The goal, the goal of that experiment is actually, we're going to make antibody against these proteins. 
uh, multiple monoclonals so that you can clear your sample with, again, with this protein and you can use BioID after that. And you won't have all of your peptides sucked by this stuff, okay? So we make monoclonal antibody in my lab, so it's actually very easy. And that will make frog embryo a good system for BioID uh, again, okay? So now, okay, typically I have a lot more than one sample. Here I have three sample. Uh, and, and what you want is to have your control or your experimental as close as possible uh, than your experimental, okay? So here, everything was precipitated with the same antibody against my favorite protein, ADAM13, okay? These cells were transfected with RFP instead of ADAM13. So these are my negative control. These cells are transfected and, and all the rest were transfected with ADAM13. The IP was done. One in the presence of RNAs inhibitor, okay? And one without RNAs inhibitor and adding RNAs to the sample. Okay, when you extract protein, your RNA get degraded. Okay, so basically adding RNAs is just like not, uh, here we've added RNAs inhibitor during the whole process. Okay, the notion was we know what protein binds to RNA. Um, what are the protein that binds in the presence or absence of, of uh, RNA to our own protein? Okay, so you get this sort of stuff, okay? These are things that bind to everything. These are things that bind specifically to uh, or negative control. So this, all of this is trash, okay? These are list of protein that don't care whether there is RNA or not. These uh, bind only to ADAM13 uh, when RNA are present. These are masks when RNA are present, okay? So, I can just cut and paste that list. <clears throat> and because it's human, it's very easy to go uh, directly from that. I just copy and I pass it into that string uh, analysis software. It's a, a software that, or, or a website that will tell you uh, what is known about interaction uh, with, with uh, different protein in your list, okay? Just to give you an idea, this is what's known about potential binder of my favorite protein here. Okay, so not much. This is what's in my mass spec sample. Okay, when you've removed the RNA, okay, really, you know, large nut. Now, if the RNA is present, okay, uh, that's what you get. Okay, so clearly the presence of RNA is masking a majority of my subprotoplasmic domain. Okay, <clears throat> and this is what's common to both with or without uh, the RNA. And I've put human ADAM13 here in that list. Okay, and it doesn't, it's, it does not interact with any of these proteins. At least it doesn't believe it interacts with any of these proteins. Uh, but, you know, uh, then you can look at here, you can look at, uh, I've uh, highlighted protein that uh, are involved in refolding in that color, uh, no, the red, okay, the HSP, and then targeting to the ER, targeting to the membrane, uh, and uh, uh, targeting to the nucleus, okay? So uh, very, very quick, easy way of comparing different protein sample uh, immediately, okay? And, and telling you what you can believe, what are the pathways that are likely to uh, be involved in the protein interaction, okay? So <clears throat> here I have now, uh, oops. Now I have, so one thing that you can notice in, in the first, or, or even in that one, is that we have a lot of ribosomal subunits. And I've been just throwing out all ribosomal subunits, assuming that oh, it's just too, uh, too abundant. Okay, that's your stuff. Now, I don't see actin ever, okay, with my stuff. Um, and, and so 
more recently, because we've seen these ribosomal protein all the time, okay, um, I've done the uh, analysis uh, from frog embryo with the same antibody, monoclonal antibody against my protein. These are ribosome, ribosomal proteins, okay? So I get two main groups, ribosomal protein and myosin, okay? My protein is in vesicle. It's riding the microtubule uh, and the actin uh, to go where it's supposed to. I would expect myosin to be involved in that process, okay? And so you see a lot of, of uh, protein. That's just from the embryo, okay? If you look at that list one by one, you've got 60, 70 proteins, um, you're never going to see what, what you want, okay? But if you can analyze all your protein at once, it's going to show you pathways and show you, you know, what are the protein of major interest. Now, by doing this sort of analysis, what I've realized is I was very focused on, are these protein actually present? And so I was extremely selective into the protein I was looking at. So I would only take protein that were, where I had three unique peptides. Okay. So three part of the same protein recognized in my mass spec sample, okay? Um, at the maximum selectivity for the peptide. Uh, and basically I know for sure that these proteins are present in my mass spec sample. But when you do that, what you find is lots of very abundant protein. It selects for abundant protein, which are not typically the most interesting protein. You will never see transcription factor, for example, with three peptides. <clears throat> and I was doing that because you can't work with 500 proteins. You've got to lower that. And the easiest way to lower it is to select your three peptides. So from 500, you're going to get to 50 proteins. It's a list that you can look at, but you're missing. So I, I was trying to compare mass spec to a previously published data of, um, for a transcription factor, 6-1. I was trying to compare what had been shown by yeast to hybrid uh, and by uh, another, yeah, yeast to hybrid, different way of uh, identifying a protein. Yeah, yeast to hybrid in, uh, with Drosophila protein and with human protein. <clears throat> and when I looked at my database uh, with three peptide, there was absolutely zero overlap. Okay. Uh, now, transcription factors are very rare. You wouldn't find three peptides. I did not find three peptides for my protein that I was pulling down. Okay. Now, I set up to one peptide. And then I had, you know, several thousand protein with one peptide. All absent in my negative control. Okay. But still a thousand protein. <clears throat> and then I take this 1,000 protein and I run them through other database of, okay, uh, the cell type that I'm looking at, okay? So I can eliminate anything that is not present in the neural crest cells. So from, you know, a thousand protein, I get to 200 protein, okay? In this 200 protein, I have 100% of all the protein that were identified previously, okay? Which were a dozen. So now I have, you know, the difference between 200 protein and a dozen protein. And I can start plugging this 200 protein into something that's like string <clears throat> and identify password. And this really changes everything, okay? Otherwise, you're going to get all the myosins, all the tubulin, all of the histones, all of the mitochondrial you know, uh, cycle. Um, and that's all you will get always. So, you know, that's, that's something that it took me many years to uh, figure out is that typically the protein that you pull down that interact with your protein of interest are never the major proteins, okay? Uh, unless they are, you know, scaffold type of protein that are, super strongly expressed. 
So another stuff that is really important. <clears throat> we were talking about triplicate. I believe in massive experiments instead. Okay, so these are 11 mutants of atom 13. Okay, they each have part mutation or deletion, deletion in the cytoplasmic domain. Uh, RFP is by negative control. And then I can look at, with just one peptide, at what is common to all of, so this are two uh, um, mutation for a phosphorylation site. So 33A is a non-phosphorylatable protein, 33D is uh, uh, mimic the phosphorylated protein. Okay, so now I can look at the protein that are attached, no matter the phosphorylation or even whether this is a serine or not, okay, to my protein, but they are absent in my negative control. Okay, so that gives me a list. And then I can look more specifically about stuff where it binds only to the phosphorylated site and not the non phosphorylated site or even the wild type. Okay. Uh, then I have those here that are binding to the wild type and the phosphorylated site. Okay. Because I expect my wild type to be phosphorylated on occasion. So that makes sense. Okay. Um, and then I have stuff that don't bind, uh, that, that bind only to the non phosphorylated form. Okay. What is also possible is that, um, uh, you know, there are protein that needs a serine here to bind, not an alanine or an aspartic acid, but the real serine. They need the hydrogen, okay? And so they would be found in the wild top, but in neither of these guys, okay? <clears throat> so, you know, it's two six-well plates. Each of these samples correspond to an IP from one well of the six-well plate. Okay, they were all done the same day, the same way. And so, you know, you're talking about biological triplicate. Here I have, you know, 11 sample. These stuff were found in 11 samples, okay, um, but not in the negative control. So that list is very solid, okay? And when I repeat the experiment, I will find these guys. Uh, often again. Okay. So that's the end of the official presentation. And if you have any questions, um, yes. So we will start with the Ten micrograms, yep. well, or twenty micrograms yep. of the protein. Yep. Once you clean with the trips, yep. you do a purification of your peptides. Yes. In another yes. I use zip tip <clears throat> to clean Can up. Can you measure the, the concentration of peptides? I'm sure you can. I never do. You don't do that. No. So you go directly. Yes. Do you concentrate those peptides? I, I speed back dry them just because that's what he wants. Yeah. So basically you have your protein sample after digestion, you add some formic acids to make it acid. You pipette it up and down in a zip tip, elude that stuff into a new tube, dry it, give it to Steve. So for example, <laughs> you your ember. Yeah. Suppose that you're interested in extracellular proteins. Yeah. Can you treat your cells with trips and centrifuge the cells and get this uh, No, but I can do better. I can grow my cells in vitro 